This is Houston Intercontinental Airport, and this is the ILS approach to runway 8 left. There are two chart products or plates out there that are used to depict this approach and help pilots brief it. There's the FAA plate, which we're already familiar with, and an approach plate from the company Jeppesen. Here they are side by side for the same approach into Houston. The FAA distributes its approach plates free of charge through its website or sites like airnav.com or in print for a small fee. They're the property of the American taxpayer. Jeppesen is a private company that produces these plates and charges its users a subscription fee. If you're looking forward to an airline job or another commercial pilot role, you can expect to be using Jeppesen plates. Let's look at the key differences between the FAA and Jeppesen plates and how these changes affect how you'd use them in the cockpit. First, let's look at the effective dates. The FAA plate has an effective date of July 15, 2021 through August 12, 2021. They're updated every 28 days. The Jeppesen plate, on the other hand, shows a date of June 14, 2019 and an effective date of June 20 the same year. At first glance, it seems like the two Jeppesen dates conflict with each other and that the plate may have expired as many as two years ago. However, let's have a look at the notations at the bottom of each plate. They both show an amendment date of June 20, 2019. The FAA designs these instrument approaches using the U.S. Standard for Terminal Instrument Procedures, or TERPS, and you can actually look up on their website the latest amendment to an approach. This one, Amendment 4E, took effect on June 20, 2019. So we know from the plates we're looking at the same up-to-date version. Let's have a closer look at the top portion of the Jeppesen plate. This is the briefing strip, and it's where Jeppesen earns that subscription fee, in my opinion. The information is laid out in such a way that pilots should be able to brief the entire approach by reading from top to bottom, left to right, entirely within this area. Starting from the top, we have the communications info. From left to right, it's the ATIS, approach, tower, and ground. Moving down, we've got approach guidance. From left to right, the localizer frequency, the final approach course, the glide slope intercept point and altitude, the decision altitude, and the airport elevation and touchdown zone elevation. Below that is the missed approach information in textual format. Next are the notes. Now these items highlighted may not make much sense to you at first if you're a US-based pilot. Well, Jeppesen has looked into it and it turns out there's actually other countries in the world besides the United States and they have instrument approach procedures too. In many other countries, altimeter settings aren't in inches of mercury, but in hectopascals. And the altitude where you can transition from a local altimeter setting to a standard pressure is not fixed at 18,000 feet like it is in the US. So this information is listed here. This is one nice thing about Jepson charts. They're standardized for all countries. Further down, you have notes and restrictions, and you have minimum safe altitudes on the right. So we've just briefed the full ILS approach eight left into Houston by just moving through the briefing strip. Let's compare this process with how we'd get the same information off the FAA plate. It starts off all right with the communications information reading left to right on each plate, but then it starts to get a bit convoluted on the FAA chart. Here's the localizer and approach course up here, then down below is the glide slope intercept, then the ILS minimums, back up top for elevations, over here for the missed approach, back to the left for notes, then down in the plan view for minimum safe altitudes. Jeppesen has streamlined the briefing process for the busy environment of an airline cockpit. Next, let's have a look at the plan view and see what's different there. First of all, Jeppesen depicts nav aids a little differently. Here's the humble VOR, which is used in the missed approach procedure. Notice the difference between the hexagon the FAA uses and the compass rose in the Jeppesen plate. Also, the primary nav aid used for lateral guidance, in this case the localizer, is shown a bit differently by Jeppesen. This helps distinguish the localizer from other nav aids like that VOR. On the FAA chart, the only distinction is a bolder line around the localizer info. Looking at the approach course, you see that the distance information is displayed a little differently. The FAA plate uses an elongated D to show DME, while the jet plate just has an uppercase D before the distance figure. The Jeppesen plate also shows secondary airports while the FAA plate leaves them off. The holding fix on the missed approach procedure is depicted very similarly in both plates, though the racetrack pattern looks a bit different. 
FAA charts use bars above and below altitude and speed figures to show restrictions. Here at the initial approach fix, Gusher, the mandatory altitude is 6,000 feet with a max airspeed of 210 knots. The Jepson plate just depicts this textually. Here's a neat thing the Jepson plate does. It has a block arrow showing the highest obstacle on the plan view, this antenna at 923 feet. Next, let's look at the profile view. The Jepson plate doesn't include an airport diagram like the FAA plate does, so it uses the extra room to show more detail on the approach profile. First, let's see how the Jepson plate depicts missed approach points. There's a so-called pull-up line here for the decision altitude on the ILS, and a line here for the minimum descent altitude missed approach point for the non-precision localizer only approach. Notice the FAA plate uses lines below the altitude restrictions to show them as minimums. On the jet plate, you'll have to know that since it's an approach, these altitudes are floors not to go below. One thing the jet plate adds that I think is also very valuable is in the time and distance section, it tells you in addition to time from final approach fix to missed approach point, what your rate of descent is in feet per minute to maintain a three degree glide path. This is a terrific way of ensuring a continuous descent on final approach or CDFA on a non-precision approach, something that is stressed in the airline world. Hence again, the Jepson plates lend themselves nicely to this airline environment. Let's have a look now at the minimum section, where things are laid out a bit differently on the two plates. The minimums are read from category A through D and E. On the FAA chart, this moves from left to right, while on the Jepson plate, they go from top to bottom, starting here with the minimums for Cat A and B aircraft, moving through the minimums for the rest of the categories. Here you see how each plate depicts the altitude and visibility minimums for the ILS approach, 294 feet and RVR 1800. On the localizer approach, the altitude minimum is 600 feet and RVR is 2400 feet. For category C aircraft and faster, it's RVR 5500. The jet plate includes these figures here as well, which tell you to raise the minimum RVR in the case that the touchdown zone or centerline lights are out to 2400 feet, or if the approach lighting system is out to 4000 feet. This is a standard condition of the reduced visibility minimums for part 121 operations, but other increased minimums like this would be depicted on the jet plate as well, whereas you might have to dig around the FAA plate elsewhere for this information, such as raising minimums for local altimeter settings not being received, etc. So while almost everyone starts out with the FAA charts because they don't require a subscription, pilots who go work for large companies like airlines can expect to make the transition to Jeppesen plates. This transition can be confusing, but taking a systematic look at the changes can be very helpful. If this was helpful, please click subscribe so that you could stay up to date on every new training video coming out each Tuesday and Friday and get access to posts and articles that'll take your training even further. It just takes one click and it's so worth it.